When you play the Game of Thrones, you win or you die. There is no middle ground. Hey everybody, Dusty here, and today I am playing the A Game of Thrones mod for Crusader Kings 3, which is in my opinion the best Game of Thrones experience currently available, as it allows players to recreate and fall victim to all the political machinations and petty personal vendettas that divine television for the better part of a decade. Now some fans will argue that the mod for Crusader Kings 2 is actually the superior option, but considering the UI in that game is completely incomprehensible to the average human, I'll just have to take their word for it. Back to Crusader Kings 3 though, I just want to point out that this video is not at all a walkthrough for how to play the game. Breaking down all the various mechanics and systems would require far more time than I'm willing to dedicate to this video, not to mention the game comes with a pretty comprehensive tutorial which does a far better job explaining all that stuff than I could ever be bothered to. No, the point of this video is to showcase the true appeal of Crusader Kings 3 and by extension this mod, which is the way that it constantly generates unique and memorable stories ensuring no two playthroughs are exactly alike. Now one of the best things about this mod is that you're also free to choose from any of the series most iconic characters as well as a bunch more who you likely have no idea even existed so if you mainly just want to make sure that Danny successfully reclaims the Iron Throne for House Targaryen and marries Jon so the two can live happily ever after with their litter of incest babies then that's definitely doable. But personally I find that being a main character is far too much responsibility. Luckily though the game also includes a pretty extensive character creator so allow me to introduce you all to Rob from House Dust. During the War of the Usurper, Rob had been a merchant, which is a nice way of saying he was a pirate, who was sympathetic to the rebels' cause and offered them his services. As a reward for this, once the war had been won, Rob was raised to the status of a lord and granted the small county of Old Honor in Maidenpool. Now before you all claim that the man's basically a ripoff of Davos, I'd like to point out that Rob has all of his fingers and is missing an eye instead. So they're completely different characters. Obviously, the first order of business for a new lord was to find a respectable bride that was suitable for his new station and he quickly settled upon to Nala Caffernan. Once the two officially tied the knot, the new couple would celebrate with a lavish feast where Rob was able to get to know some of his new subjects and fellow vassals and fight over the favor of his liege with others. The marriage with Tanala quickly proved to be fruitful as it didn't take long for her to give birth to a pair of twins, including a son Anton, who would serve as Rob's heir. Sorry Hildy, but you're always going to be playing second fiddle to your brother. Hey, don't blame me. I don't make the rules of the patriarchy. I just happily enforce them. Not long after this, Rob's mercantile skills are officially recognized as his liege William, the Lord of Maidenpool, names him as his steward. However, despite all these increased responsibilities and newfound prestige, Rob was still a bit of a ruthless dickhead at heart, and his talent for generating wealth was only matched by his ability to manipulate those around him for his own benefit. Even the High Septon himself soon discovered he wasn't exempt from the influence of the seemingly minor lord, and soon found himself under Rob's thumb. So naturally, when William asked Rob to see to the education of his son Miles, Rob humbly accepted. Now at this point, allow me to go on a little bit of a detour, as I know some of you would be interested to know what the main cast had been up to, and as it turns out, they'd been playing musical chairs with the Iron Throne over in King's Landing. See, one day Bobby B suddenly died under very mysterious circumstances, so as you'd expect, the young Joffrey inherited the throne. However, for some unknown reason, it turns out that nobody wanted this kid as their king, so a bunch of lords got together and demanded that Renly assume his place, and since he lacked popular support, Joffrey had no choice but to give in to their demands. However, in an ironic twist in this alternate timeline, Renly ends up being the one who gets gored by a boar, and since he lacked any children, the throne passed back to Joffrey. Again though, absolutely nobody wanted Joffrey as their king, but I guess they also didn't want Stannis, because rather than support any claimant, everybody just decided that the realm of the Seven Kingdoms had run its course and went back to being independent. As a domino effect, this also meant that Daenerys never had a reason to stage an invasion, since there was no Iron Throne left for her to reclaim, and no Iron Throne meant no king Kingsguard, which freed Jaime Lannister up from his oaths, so despite having to watch his grandson fumble away the Iron Throne twice, there's an argument to be made that the newly crowned King Tywin ended up being the big winner in all this. Truth be told though, Rob was so far down on the totem pole that none of this really affected him in the slightest. His main priority is concerned handling the education of his children and making sure they develop the sort of political clout that would serve them later in life, while also making sure to find the time to help mold his young ward, 
smiles into the type of fine young man that will one day make his family proud. Now the commoners might not want to hear it, but it turns out that being a lord and dealing with all the headaches that come along with it can actually be pretty stressful, which would lead Rob to become a frequent patron of the brothels of Old Honor, and predictably this sort of behavior led him to develop some STDs, which he promptly passed along to his poor wife. Eventually, Tanala would die from unrelated causes, but honestly, Rob wasn't really all that broken up about it, as it gave him even more time to devote to his various schemes, which would culminate with him forcing his lord to name him as his regent. And it didn't take long at all for him to find ways to leverage his new powers for his own personal benefit, and while his liege might have suspected that Rob was abusing his authority, the Lord of Maidenpool was never actually able to prove it. Now, a few spies did begin to show up in Old Honor during this time, but once they were sent to the dungeons, they were never heard from again. Well, aside from some blood-curling screams during the occasional torture session. Torture? This is an interrogation. And despite his lord's doubts, Rob was able to convince them to marry his granddaughter Marianne off to Anton's son Florian. Now, poor William here probably thought that this connection would form a strong bond between him and his vassal, but it wound up being the worst mistake he could have possibly made. Because now that his title was set to pass to House Dust, William no longer served any purpose to his ambitious vassal, so he was soon disposed of. Now, there was a small issue of the fact that Marianne's father was still very much alive and capable of producing a male offspring who would leapfrog Marianne in the line of succession, so Rob made sure to handle that too. And now that Marianne's best interests directly aligned with the future prosperity of House Dust, Rob proved that he could be an effective, if heavy-handed administrator, and the Duchy of Maidenpool thrived under his guidance. However, everything comes to a close eventually, and after serving as the Lord of Old Honor for 42 years, Rob finally passed on, but he did so secure in the knowledge that his actions had potentially ensured the glory of his house for generations to come. Now, Marion did die shortly after the birth of her daughter, Arona, which meant that Rob's grandson, Florian, was unable to produce any more heirs with a legitimate claim on Maidenpool, but we'll cross that bridge when we get to it. In the meantime, though, Old Honor was left under the care of Anton, and with his father having already laid down all the groundwork, he was free to live the life of luxury you'd expect from a lord, as he passed his days by going out on hunts, throwing feasts, and taking in all the news and rumors that were flying around the various kingdoms. Although, full disclosure, the feasts were mainly a ploy for him to be able to spend time with his sister. See, his father had uncovered news of their unnatural relationship shortly before he kicked the bucket, but he kept it covered up to keep the good name of House Dust unsullied. Sister fucking aside, though, the 13-year-old reign of Anton would ultimately prove to be uneventful, although after the chaotic nature of their previous lord, I'm sure the citizens of Old Honor were happy with some stability, and they were blissfully unaware that that would all soon come to an end. Now, Florian wasn't close to being the cold-hearted villain that his grandfather had been, and preferred winning glory on the tourney fields to extracting secrets in some dank dungeon. In fact, he would have been perfectly content handing off the reins to his daughter, Arona, except that there was one small problem as she died during childbirth. Thankfully, the child, a boy named Orland, does survive, so Maidenpool is still technically in the hands of House Dust. However, Florian isn't comfortable having all the hopes and dreams of his beloved grandfather resting on the shoulders of one fragile child. So he finds a way to put the grief of the death of Marion behind him, takes another wife, and once he receives confirmation that she's expecting a child, he uses his position as regent to claim the title of High Lord of Maidenpool for himself and declares war on his grandson. The armies of House Dust and their allies quickly set out to conquer Orland's holdings and slap his army around, and a little over a year later, the whole thing's been resolved with Florian emerging victorious. The pesky matter of a truce between the two kept Florian from revoking Maidenpool's capital from his grandson, and he might have been willing to let the boy keep it if Orland wasn't constantly whining about how Florian had embezzled gold from his treasury to help fund the coup, and just generally being a sore loser. So Florian denounced Orland, which gave him the legal right to imprison him. As expected, Orland essentially told the old man to eat shit, and Maidenpool once again found itself embroiled in civil war. Now, I'll admit that I originally underestimated how much support Orland would receive from his fellow vassals in the early stages of the war did not go well for Florian. However, after calling in some backup, he was able to turn everything around, and eventually Orland ended up being put under house arrest, leaving Florian free to strip him of his lands, although he would be granted the small barony of Tall Pine Keep as a minor consolation prize. Now, some people would have been enticed to build on the success and attempt to continue to expand their sphere of influence, but Florian was not an ambitious man by nature, and overthrowing his grandson had taken a sizable toil on his mental well-being. So once the situation was 
firmly under control, he was more than happy to retire in a quiet life and spend his golden years serving House Tully as a dutiful and loyal vassal. However, while Florian might have been content with the current status quo, there's no guarantee that his sons would feel the same way once they all eventually came of age. Hey everybody, I hope you all enjoyed this video. If you didn't, then I've got no clue why you're still hanging around. Like, what are you doing? But if you did enjoy it, then why not leave a like and consider subscribing to the channel to be kept up to date with all my latest content. Or don't, you know, don't let me tell you how to live your life. Anyway, as always, thanks for watching. I'm out.